if you wanted to surveil somebody apart from those things, you had to physically assign someone to take photographs of you or follow you down the street. And we've gone in a really rapid period of time, and you think about it, through this expansion of email records, we could actually construct quite a detailed mesh of people's social relationships. You can tell just from the from the frequency of contact if somebody's going through a relationship breakup, for example. You don't have to read the emails, but you can infer, sometimes incorrectly, relationship networks and patterns of contact between people just from email. And then this kind of explosion with mobile phones, where suddenly you've got locational records that come into the picture. We can actually trace people's movements around the landscape in a reasonably fine-grained way. Photographs and videos that are all date, time and location stamped and carry various other kinds of metadata. And being able to build these really fine-grained relationship maps of people, where you can actually know more about people's pattern of life than they potentially do themselves. Again, just from opening the envelope, as, as Brandis expressed in that Walkley Award-winning um, comedy clip of 2014. Then the financial data explosion, which I feel like is maybe a little bit underdone in our analysis of this stuff, or perhaps that's just me. Um, cash is visibly disappearing from our landscape because it's so bloody convenient to just wave your card over a scanner. And that's creating, again, really densely intricate financial maps of people's pattern of life that really didn't even exist five years ago. And then finally, again, a little bit underdone because it's in the process of happening and we probably aren't going to understand the significance of it until we're looking at it in the rearview mirror, the so-called Internet of Things. Who follows Internet of Shit on Twitter? Okay, the, the entire room. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, if you don't, please follow Internet of Shit. But the streetscape itself is becoming sensate, and that is a seriously big deal. I don't. We haven't thought through what that means um, when the most intimate of all, you know, possible biometric data is being uploaded to servers on the far side of the world. When the home itself is becoming smart, you patch in facial recognition to that kind of stuff um, and this whole sort of smart city agenda. And it's extraordinary that against this incredible explosion of oceans of material that didn't exist before that could be trawled by the state, they still complain about going dark. I'm so fucking overhearing that argument. Oh, we're going dark. We're losing access to people's personal records. Oh, hang on a second. The state now has access to the most extraordinarily detailed um, patterns of people's lives and the most intimate details of our relationships. And I'm really overhearing that argument that we're going dark and we need ever more intrusive powers and access to this stuff anyway. I feel like I'm now quite aggressively preaching to the converted. Um, <laughs> But being aware, I guess, that there are kind of three poles or three actors that are that are coming at this. This is like dramatic oversimplification, and I hope you'll critique this and tear it to bits later later in the session. Um, firstly, the state, which is agenda, is mostly around control. Whether it's around control of welfare recipients, whether it's control of protesters, trade union organisers, people who might have a different point of view, journalists who might be talking to somebody who saw something horrific happen on Manus Island. Um, and this is being advanced against a completely legitimate agenda of public safety. It's, you know, the state's primary role to keep us safe. And a lot of other really queasy stuff gets advanced under underneath that umbrella. The second set of actors, I guess, the corporations, their agenda is a bit different. It's around market share and it's around extracting value from populations of people who are rapidly becoming the product. So those patterns of data that are being trawled are the product. You know, any service that's offered to you for free, you can be reasonably confident that that means you're the product that's that's being sold off to somebody else. But they don't have the same agenda. Um, and Glenn Greenwald, who I guess some of you would have seen the interview when he Skyped, uh, when he Skyped into here not that long ago, had made the point that uh, what the Snowden revelations did was drove a bit of a wedge between the American tech companies and the state, where before you'd seen them actually start to fuse together and the first few prison PowerPoint slides kind of made that really obvious and uh, you know like the Facebooks and the Apples and the Googles of the world didn't like being named up and called out in that way and it drove a bit of a wedge between those two really important power centers that have sometimes aligned but subtly different incentives and, and values in that debate and also as we've seen in Australia um, I think in actually in quite an honourable way, frequently it's the technical community and the developers and the people who make these tools who are the wisest and most literate and sometimes most legible voices against some of the hideous things that are being 
done, not just in a design sense of designing more intelligent tools that don't predate on the user base, but also in the public domain. And we were kind of musing over this a little bit at lunch that you used to have um, companies like Ionet run by people who, who part of their brand actually was about defense of users' privacy. And you had some pretty vocal spokespeople out there making, uh, I think, really valuable public contributions. So I'm not trying to be too black and white, but just pointing out, I guess, that the incentives are a little bit split between the state and the corporates. And then the third poll, the third kind of category of actors, I guess it'd be partly represented or maybe actually quite well represented by people in this room, people who are speaking from the public interest, the interest of the user base, and aren't coming from a particularly commercial point of view one way or another. And that is the developers, the technical community, but also civil rights organisations, state actors like the Privacy Commissioner that actually have a mandate, um, like a really important mandate, to speak out when they see stuff going on. Um, and in Australia, frequently, it's that third group of people or folk who would come along to an event like this who provide the incredibly important counterbalance when we see the government and the opposition lining up together and all playing their, their preferred roles, whoever it happens to be at any, you know, in any, at any given time. Uh, it's the folk in this room who provide that counterpoint and provide the public debate and raise the costs, the political and the technical costs of mass surveillance. So, um, I think here come the predictions. Here come the miserable predictions. So one, um, government announces the latest scope creep in incremental extension of state intrusive power. So we could take, for example, the June ex example of George Brandis. I lost count of how many times he was bragging about going to a Five Eyes meeting in Ottawa. Like, I don't know whether you folks kept count. So I, yeah, we know George. We, we understand. That's where you're going. That's great. Uh, or today, COAG has um, released this communique on seamless facial recognition, kind of the next incremental boiling of the frog um, in that particular pot of boiling water. Um, and it was, it was announced, which is not always the way they do it, under the cover of this other outrage of arbitrary detention. Like that, that runs hard up against several hundred years of legal due process. And it, I don't know whether that, I'm presuming that stuff was deliberate, these people do think these kinds of things through, but I think that's kind of important that it was introduced against the cover of this other thing and again shopped to us in the name of national security. So as prediction one, okay that happens, that's going to keep happening. Two, reflexively, without really even thinking about it, labour folds, they just fold. Uh, I think it was Albanese was out on the crypto thing before in June the government even announced what it was that they wanted to do who just said, yeah, we're probably going to support this. We are bipartisan where it comes to public safety and national security. And they know how cynical this is. They're not willing to take a political risk. And that's up to us, in a way. That's up to us to raise the political cost to that kind of capitulation, as we'd started to do with the data retention debate. Uh, three, Parliament goes through the motions. So whatever the outrage of the day is gets shopped to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. That's a closed shop. That's the two major parties, and for a period of time it actually was all men uh, from the two major parties. They even knocked off uh, Andrew Wilkie's spot, who is somebody who does have an independent point of view on this kind of thing. So they chopped that out, and now it's basically the place where Labor goes to find some kind of concession that they can wave around and say, we improved data retention. We've created a completely ineffective and pathetic regime of... Um, of warrants if you're going to spy on a journalist of a, a different piece of process that you can circumvent. But they come away with some kind of piece of paper that they can wave around and say, so we've improved this, it's now even more stringent and we're going to move these amendments and the government says this is fine and it goes through. And of course that is where the folk in this room make submissions and write things up and put out heartfelt press statements and then the steamroller kind of comes over us and we get flattened. And then the fourth thing is, when it finally comes to debate, the Greens and a couple of free-thinking crossbenchers will condemn, we will try to amend it, and then we will get flattened as well. Those are my four shitty predictions for how encryption, the encryption debate is going to go and how this latest extension of the facial recognition database is going to go. And I'd like you to hold me those predictions, and I hope dearly that it's the folk in this room who are going to prove them wrong. That somewhere along the line we can disrupt this. It's been disrupted before. It doesn't always follow this script. But unless we start getting a little bit more creative, a little bit more obstructive, maybe a little bit less polite and well-mannered, those two things are going to follow exactly down that path. And then they will think of something else. For a while there was a little subcommittee. I don't know if it ever had a formal name. That was, it was, this was under Abbott. That was tasked with coming up with a national security announcement once a week. That never got as ridiculous as Turnbull standing in front of a boat with a machine gun and a bunch of SAS guys in masks. It never got that ridiculous, but this is where we live. They will keep coming up with announceables. And so we're going to have to, 
I guess get better at what we do, and I very firmly include myself in this. We've got to get better at disrupting this rather dismal thing. So a couple of quick ideas about how we can be wrong in these predictions, and I'm going to hand over to some smarter people with some better ideas. So firstly, being aware that this is something we can fix as well. We're not coming from a rights-based perspective. If you look at how the debate in the US has rolled out and in various European countries, they're benchmarking these things against human rights protections that are legislated or constitutional. Now, the rights-based debate in the United States was what Ed Snowden tapped into, I would argue very, very effectively. We didn't have the same quality of debate as they had in the United States, even with the kind of some of the lunatic politics swirling around there. It was a debate informed by centuries of rights-based debate on the power of the state, and we don't have that here. And the protections that we have are mostly imaginary. They're not written down anywhere. They're just things that we kind of take for granted and are getting chipped away from time to time. So um, from our point of view, and come here to, to pitch for the Greens at all, but Nick McKim, uh, who's our Attorney General spokesperson, um, is in the process of launching a campaign for a Human Rights Act in Australia. We're the only comparable country that doesn't have one that would apply some formal legislative protections which would make it much harder for these things to just appear in a vacuum. So I feel like we can play a really important role in updating people's ideas of what human rights mean. You know, we're not, we're not having a debate from the 17th century. We're talking about who owns your data and what can be done with it. Uh, in the name of various corporations or, or states um, around the world. So that feels like kind of an important thing, not to just have this as a digital rights argument. This is about the rights of all of us as human beings. Some of these ideas are old, and it's good to refresh them. The second thing uh, is they've picked a really serious fight. They've picked a fight with mathematics. <laughs> like, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, Turnbull's famous comment. Well, the rights of mathematics are all very well, but it's the rights of Australia that prevail. Sorry, sunshine, he's in for a... See, it's a very Brandis-esque thing to have said. Um, but that's on our side. Like, what they're proposing to do, once we can get a bit better grip on what it is, is formidably technically difficult. And so that makes it more likely to fail. And that's something, I guess, that's on our side. In the same way as the implementation of data retention has been a debacle. What they're trying to do is actually really difficult. And so that's something that we can play to as well. That we have allies thinking again about the crypto fight to come. They've picked a fight with the tech giants offshore. Not all of them have the best reputation in this country, but we'll take our allies where we can get them. With the global banking sector, with people running hedge funds, like with really powerful interests who rely on very, very strong bulletproof cryptography to be able to shift huge blocks of capital around the world and smash up the planet and milk entire populations. So they're on our side of the, of the spreadsheet as well. That's wonderful, isn't it? They, any, this is anybody with a bank account has a really strong interest in the Australian government not being able to do some of the stuff that appears to be trying to do. So that counts for something as well. And more voices did a little thumbnail audit of uh, of press reporting, because the press loves this stuff. The internet loves talking about itself. I got told by a couple of journalists, this stuff has, you know, like crazy click-through rates. Anything with Ed Snowden's attached to it, anything about your privacy online or data breaches and that kind of stuff, really people love looking at that stuff. They love sharing it. It's so the press likes writing about it. That's on our side. And they are looking for fresh voices. They're looking for technically literate, smart people who aren't necessarily politically affiliated, to have a point of view that says actually what the government's trying to do is really dumb. Look at the latest uh, round of reporting on the facial recognition stuff or on the crypto reporting in June and after, and that was there. There are third-party voices there, and that helps raise the political cost of coming up with this dumb stuff. Um, the next one that I kind of came up with, again, preaching to the solidly converted, particularly in a ThoughtWorks office, is design good tools. Design tools that aren't predatory on the user base. I got to go to DEF CON in Las Vegas in um, 2014, so not that long after the Snowden, well, like, like a, a year or 18 months after, after the Snowden bombshells had hit. And this is a community of people who are feeling pissed off and betrayed by their own state. And they realize that politics has failed them, and in some cases, so is the law. They said, all right, stuff it. We're going to design tools that bake strong crypto into really accessible consumer level um, tools. And that was kind of a powerful moment of realizing just how important that particular community is. Like, you don't have to wait for the politicians to fix this stuff. They're always going to be 10 years behind and kind of jerked around on the strings of the media cycle and various other things. But building tools that actually respect the user base, I feel like we shouldn't lose sight of that. And then 
educating people, which again, Thorworks has played a really important role in doing via at lending technical expertise to crypto parties and that kind of stuff, like making these tools accessible to people so that we're not just sitting around passively waiting for the state to fix this stuff. I don't think we should let politicians or the state off the hook. You know, I don't think we should, you know, be happy to find ourselves in an arms race, a technical arms race with the people that we elect democratically. I think, I don't think that's good enough at all. But while we're having that fight, I think that kind of personal protection and basic tech literacy is just always going to be a really important part of the debate. Raising the political cost of surveillance, and again, I'll throw this out as a contestable point. I feel like we lost the data retention debate after four or five years, but we raised the political cost and we subtly tilted the landscape for some of the fights to come. Labor is still pissed off at us for how hard we hurt them in the data retention debate. They decided really early on that they were going to support that, but we made it hurt them politically. We didn't quite get it to hurt the government, but raising not just the the, the cost of indiscriminate drift net surveillance by starting to put good crypto into consumer level tools, but raising the political costs of having these fights in the first place so that Labor get a little bit of political cover when they're in opposition to be able to more strongly critique some of the more lunatic stuff that comes out of the Attorney General's mouth. And what was the last one? Oh yeah, being bold. I was having a chat to Nick on the way back into the city. He was talking, um, are you speaking tonight? Because I don't want to steal you had a really great point. I'm not going to pinch it. <laughs> a night off. Uh, about what we could learn from the Enviro movement, um, who have run, you know, not always successful, but really incredibly high profile and important campaigns to protect the biological commons. And we're talking about protection of the information commons here. So what can we learn? And what popped into my head was, well, one of the main tools of that movement has been direct action, it has been really bolshy, high profile, um, interventions where people put their bodies in the way and it's a way of drawing attention to a particular kind of injustice. Trade unionists have done the same thing. Abolitionists did the same thing. So it kind of got me thinking a little bit about what our equivalent here. And boycotting the census is one feeble example, but it catches a little bit of attention. So what else is there out there that we can do? Um, having the Prime Minister explain how to avoid data retention by downloading WhatsApp. Like that's a small but kind of hilarious example. Um, of how personal actions can maybe tilt the debate a little bit. Um, so I guess I'm throwing that out there more as a question than as a proposition. Or what can we learn from other social movements here and around the world who have been trying to protect the public interest against other very powerful and embedded interests? And then finally, if we don't tell the story of our wins, nobody else is going to. Um, again, reminded at lunch, we don't have data retention applicable to civil uh, legal cases. That was when I thought we were probably buggered. And that was one on the papers, like that was one through some committee inquiries, through some really su sustained arguments, submissions and smart people who kind of got in the faces of the decision makers and headed that one off at the pass. And so nobody knows that we won. And if, if we don't write that history and acknowledge the people who managed to pull that off, um, then that will very quickly get, get swept under the carpet as well. We've got a kind of cobbled together semi non-functional internet filter instead of the monstrosity that Senator Conroy was proposing in about 2009. And that was because, you know, including some of the people in this room, it wasn't really coordinated, it wasn't strategic, but it was bloody effective. Uh, and over the course of two or three years, we managed to knock that off. We held off data retention under, I lost count actually, maybe three Labor Attorneys General, is the AG Department continually just pushing this idea, data retention, pushing it, pushing it. And Nicola Roxon threw it to a public inquiry and threw a little bit of sunshine onto it. Mark Dreyfus, in the brief period of time he was Attorney General, kind of just put it into the bin. And then they find somebody kind of compliant enough to do their bidding and you get George Brandis turns up and then you get a data retention scheme. But in the meantime, like we kind of had them on the back foot for a period of time. There's a certain amount of attrition. So these things aren't always lost. And that dismal set of four predictions that I made before don't always apply because we do come up with creative stuff and we can have our wins. And we can step it up. We can stop being polite. We can fight dirty. Because the other side sure as hell is. And remind people that we all have a stake in things like strong crypto. And the profile of these kind of issues changes and kind of sours every time somebody loses control. Was it 3 billion? I couldn't believe that there were 3 billion Yahoo user accounts at all. I don't know whether there's some double counting. Like, that's a really substantially large number, right? That's, there's 3 billion people using that thing? 
right, there's a little bit of double counting. Those stuff kind of go off like depth charges in the in the global unconsciousness, I think. It's like they have no way of safeguarding this stuff. And for me, that's the real scandal here. This is kind of what I wanted to close on, is that we do have a crypto emergency because safeguards, data safeguards and security safeguards on increasingly ubiquitous devices are so shitty, are so vague and not there. Who's heard of screwdriving? So, uh, sorry to end on this. Yeah, okay, in this room, a fair number. You can, you can hack sex toys. If you get close enough to, it's not Bluetooth, it's some other thing. If you get, is it? Is this some kind of cousin of Bluetooth? But something like that. You can, uh, you can take control of these things. I feel like, where the hell is the government attention on this, this surge of connected devices that are coming into people's homes, coming into the streetscape, coming into the cars, coming into, you know, everything? Uh, for me, that's the real scandal here, is that instead of taking that on directly and preventing the sale of materials unless they're properly, properly locked down and not expecting the user base to understand or care about this stuff, they are instead proposing to weaken such technical standards as do exist. And I feel like we can be on a winner. This can be the next one that we can put up and say, you took on, you took on mathematics and also the scrappy insurgency and thank God you lost. Anyway, I'm looking forward to being part of the conversation about exactly how they lose. So thanks for having us up. Thank you.